Greetings, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Mistake Zone, your weekly dose of our lives and the mistakes within them. My name is Jaron Wade. Joining me, as always, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Matt Alba. Hey, Matt. Yo. How are you doing? I'm feeling bad. I'm feeling bad. (laughs) Matt. Uh Uh-huh. I'm sorry to hear that, man. Oh, man. And as someone who is currently riding the razor's edge of (laughs) feeling okay and Matt Mm -hmm. might might not feel the greatest by the end of the week, I have to ask, Mm -hmm. Matt, Mm -hmm. what's up, man? Why aren't you feeling the greatest right now? Jared, I made I made a fat bad a good a good ish food choice followed by a bad ish food choice. Matt, mm-hmm. I have to ask. Mm-hmm. Did, did you commit a food crime? Jared, I don't think I committed a food crime. I think I committed an over an a food overindulgence. <laughs> Matt, we're not spring chickens anymore. Matt, no. what do we mm-hmm. talk about every week? <laughs> Jared, Jared, I guess this is uh, this week's segment of My Bad Body. Father Time continuing to beat us down once again. Matt, mm-hmm. which round did you lose this week? Jaren, I lost I lost a pretty big uh, food round in that. Um, Jaren, I've been seeing, you know, that kind of, I don't know, I guess like that viral kind of like, you know, food hack for like any kind of uh, ramen noodle. Okay. Um, it's been like coming back around again where, you know, you basically just like you take your ramen powder and like, you know, whatever ingredients or, you know, like stock and vegetables and stuff come with the, uh, ramen, you put that into the bowl, like dry, you cook the noodles, you know, of course, like separately, and then you mix the, you know, flavor packet and stuff with an egg yolk and a yep, bit yep. of kewpie mayo. Yes. You know, and then like, you know, whatever other mix-ins you, you got, uh, you know, this time I decided, you know, throw in some green onions, throw in some um, of that, you know, like those pre-fried tofu cubes. And, you know, I, I, I went on that and, you know, that that's perfectly fine. You know, went on some like, you know, just like some classic bulldog uh, carbonara because I feel like of that's course. it. Matt, mm-hmm. guess what I had for dinner or <laughs> was the side of my dinner tonight. Oh, man, Jaren, was it some bulldog, uh, bulldog ramen? Yep. You know, you know, I busted open that pink, that pink uh, package, man. Mm, mm, mm. And yeah, yeah, like that was good. And then I decided to follow up with my, I, you know, when I went to go to the store to go buy some of that bulldog ramen, I saw, you know, turtle chips. Yes. Yeah. So I saw a flavor I hadn't seen before, which is basically just sour cream and onion. And Jaren, I am, you know, happy to say that it is a, you know, good flavor of turtle chips. I am uh, sad to say that I am about three fourths of a bag gone of uh, turtle chips, and now my my stomach really really hurts. Matt, <laughs> that's, a, that's no good, man. That's no good. <laughs> <laughs> As someone who every time he opens a bag of chips and wants to destroy it all in one go, which I probably could still, mm-hmm. think, thankfully or maybe not, uh, I shouldn't be grateful for that. It's I don't know, Matt. It's a test of wills when you battle against Father Time and trying to not only pace yourself, but know your mm-hmm. limits. Mm-hmm. Because I don't know, Matt, as much as I love chips, I feel like mm-hmm. it's so easy nowadays to overindulge and just not feel great, as for your example right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But Matt, mm-hmm. <laughs> have to ask, this might be t- TMI, but uh, for me personally, when I overindulge in chips, I feel really bloated. Matt, on the scale mm-hmm. of 1 to 10, how bloated are you right now? I don't actually feel too bloated right now, Jared. Okay. I think Fair, Matt. for me, it's really just a, I, I think, you know, it's like meat sweats, but for chips. Matt, mm-hmm. slightly alarming. Slightly, <laughs> we're going to keep an eye on that for uh-huh. the next hour while uh-huh. we podcast uh-huh. oh, and discuss. Matt, we'll, we'll do the occasional... Uh, chip sweat check in, and hopefully everything is a okay. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. speaking about indulgence, mm-hmm. I indulged in some steam purchases this week. You know, while the crew never safe, mm-hmm. never safe. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to touch base with you again with a follow up to what I brought to the table last week in uh, this new extreme sports, you know, adjacent roguelite. Uh, Motor Doom. I played the mm-hmm. demo last week and I told you that, hey, 
came out recently, 10% off the launch price. And I, you know, I enjoyed my time with the demo. So I purchased the full game and I have a better understanding now of its overall package. And as I highlighted last week, Matt, Motor Doom is a roguelite in the vein of a horde-based survival meets Tony Hawk's Pro Skater on the Mm -hmm. PS1, Mm -hmm. where you do have those, you know, we've had this discussion before, but let's say that crude PS1 aesthetic um, mixed with, you know, the heavy metal Doom vibes, plus you leveling up, getting more power-ups for you to continuously attack all the enemies that are trying to surround you. And with mm-hmm. Motor Doom, I wanted to kind of correct myself what I said last week. So in terms of modes that the game offers, Matt, you have your standard career mode, which this is more in line with what you expect out of a Tony Hawk game where you have a five-minute run, you have a goal of 10 objectives, and you just have to complete as many as you can within that time limit. Once that time limit expires, a boss is summoned, and you just have to defeat the boss to complete your run. Oh, okay. And then, likewise, you have a... Not necessarily a wave-based mode, but there are two survival modes. There's a 10-minute survival, which... You know, like the career mode, there's no objectives. You just have 10 minutes to skate around, get your upgrades, and try to beat the boss at the end of the 10 minutes. And Mm -hmm. then you have an endless mode, which you need to, again, Matt, just survive as long as you can. And with the objectives going to the career mode, this is how you unlock new characters, I believe. Because, Matt, the career mode spans five levels. Uh, It starts off with your basic warehouse equivalent you know if you've played a extreme sports game from that era you know what the warehouse level is Mm -hmm. and then as you progress it's the levels do get a bit more you know bigger a bit more vertical but never to the level of say something like tony hawk 3 tony hawk 4 so it's in the vein of tony hawk 1 level sizes uh but not even as big as say some san francisco for example Mm -hmm. but Um, your objectives are pretty obvious. You have your score ones, your combo ones, collect motor, uh, collect combo in one combo, destroy objects, find the hidden tape, and so on. And when you complete all objectives for one of the levels, you unlock the ability to purchase a new character. So you asked me last week, what are the differences between the characters? Mm -hmm. Uh, They each have their own kind of passive or active abilities where the character I mentioned last week, uh, the skeleton with a sidecar with another skeleton that essentially auto shoots for you uh, where, you know, you can shoot manually with R1 and then go into slow motion with L1. But with the skeleton duo, you just automatically shoot. Or when you complete the second level, you can unlock the ability to purchase this nun with the shotgun whose i guess <laughs> ability is she has a shotgun uh-huh. so um one thing i also wanted to follow up with you matt is something you asked me last week about the power-up system where yeah. whenever you complete a combo you bank that xp and that contributes to you unlocking your power-up and I said that when I played through the demo initially, I felt it was pretty okay just because, you know, you're trying to get your bearings, you're trying to see what everything does and kind of, you know, tailor it to your run. Mm-hmm. Where now that I have a better handle on the game, I completely agree, Matt. You need to go into options and choose auto select so you don't have to bother with like the nonsense. Because, Matt, I'll be completely honest. Mm hmm. While I enjoy my time with Motor Doom, I feel like the Tony Hawk aspect is at odds with the roguelite element aspect, Mm. where I don't feel... Now that I have a few hours under my belt with Motor Doom, it's a serviceable Tony Hawk game at its core. But at the same time, I feel like the vampire survivorness, the roguelite elements kind of get in the way of kind of that flow state as we mentioned last week where Mm -hmm. it's 
I feel like those two genres, while I want them to work together, don't necessarily work as much as I want them to. Because Matt, for example, say in career mode, you're doing the challenges. You're supposed to collect motor. You're supposed to do combos. But if you level up too fast enough and then you end up getting, oh, I want my character to go faster. I want them to jump higher and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. You lose the precision aspect so it gets kind of harder to get those letters oh. it, you might go really fast so you're overshooting you know certain objects you wanted to grind for the combo for example where oh, i feel weird. like you're playing two different games like er, you have to do those challenges early on mm -hmm. because once you level up fast enough and that if you're sufficient with your combos you'll level up notably fast mm -hmm. and again your early game should be about the objective because your late game, you're probably too beefed up to really actually have the precision to do those challenges. Uh, and then the actual vampire survivor, the roguelite elements, I feel like it's also not challenging. Maybe I need to put up the difficulty just because with the endless modes and like the 10 minute mode, you can pick, you know, level one, level two, or level three. And I've only, level one, I think, shouldn't, if you have experience with this genre, whether it be the roguelite and especially the Tony Hawk extreme mm -hmm. sports stuff, you should probably start at two or three because one, uh, I haven't died once. Uh, and again, the enemies don't seem to really interfere with your combos, especially early on. And then you'll start unlocking power-ups. Oh, like flames while you grind or a chainsaw up front where, I don't know, Matt, it's it's a fun game, but at the same time, you only get five levels, handful of characters. And Matt, it, I have to admit, it feels weird when you don't have a revert. So when you say you use a quarter pipe... You go up in the air. Mm -hmm. You have to do the manual motion when you hit the ramp again. That that that's un that ain't that that's unnatural well. without the revert button. But I feel like if this sounds like up your alley, twenty dollars Canadian, I think is a decent price point for it. But I think I'm leaning towards maybe wait for a deeper sale now that I've had a few hours under my belt. Where I'm in, I'm definitely enjoying it. Mm -hmm. but it's it's showing the rough edges a lot more the more hours you're in it has if anything i'm not sure if the demo is still available maybe check that out first but yeah i'm hoping this has eventually get some steam workshop support just to mod in some new levels especially just because i think the level design is on the weaker end but then again i'm coming from a place of you know, decades of Tony Hawk experience. Mm -hmm. So Motor Doom is, I'm enjoying it, but my call right now is, I, I feel like this is a specific niche. And if you're really into Tony Hawk, the, the roguelite elements might kind of deter you. And if you're really into the roguelite, maybe the Tony Hawk stuff might deter you. So mm -hmm. uh, check out the demo, but maybe wait for a deeper discount. That, that, that's, that's my kind of call after a few hours uh, this week, Matt. But tell me if you heard this before. Mm -hmm. A roguelite based on a gambling card game mm -hmm. also came out this week. And Matt, Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Dungeons and Degenerate Gamblers, where I'm going to try my hardest not to compare this to Bellatro. Okay. Because I believe this game has been in development, was announced way before uh, Bellatro even released its demo uh, in development. Uh, but unfortunately came out after the Bellatro Zeitgeist. So it is getting a lot of, you know, comparisons, whether valid or unfair. I'm going to lean towards unfair just because, Matt, this oh. is a run-based blackjack game where I think at its core, I really like the concept where um, when you begin, you only have access to five different decks or four different decks, and they're based on kind of each suit of a card deck, Matt. 
where I believe the easiest deck they recommend is for you to start with hearts because Matt, Mm -hmm. the basis of Dungeons and Degenerate Gamblers is essentially you starting a encounter against an opponent and you're playing blackjack against them where you both have your own life meter. I guess for example, Matt, we both have 50 XP or 50 Mm -hmm. HP Mm -hmm. and then we play blackjack. We hit until... You stand at 18, I stand at 19. Since I win and there is a one point difference, you get one damage. Mm -hmm. But say you say I bust uh, and you stand at 17, I take 17 damage. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the battle system between it. And it progresses like your typical um, roguelite where... Of course, with a name like Dungeons and Degenerate Gamblers, you start off at a local, I guess, just a pub. And then you're trying to take on these different, um, I guess, you know, fantasy medieval character types with the sole goal to fight the manager of the pub and then ultimately figure out who runs this whole establishment. And then from there, you go on to the different floors of, oh, do I mm-hmm. want to traverse into the basement? Do I want to go to the lounge? Do And then once I finish those areas, I go to like the high roller area. Or So you're really f- trying to figure out who actually just runs this degenerate gambling den overall. And at its core, that's how what the gameplay loop is. That's the mm-hmm. roguelite setting. But that... This mm-hmm. wouldn't be a, you know, roguelite without the different power-ups. And yes. I think this is where it took me a while to finally get into the group of Dungeons & Degenerate Gamblers just because it starts off, like, pretty slow. But then after every round, mat, you have a chance to add one of four cards into your deck and then Mm -hmm. these are your flavor cards and that there are over Mm -hmm. 300 flavor cards to collect and you can definitely tell the developers are fans of just trading card games in general because all the different references you see Mm -hmm. uh from hearthstone from pokemon to gwent matt really Uh enjoyed the card references but Mm -hmm. i think this is where i have to do an unfair comparison to bellatro where I think at a glance, um, I'm not sure if you feel this way, Matt, but with everything going on in Bellatro, I feel like you can more or less understand what's happening with when glancing over a Joker card, for example. And that's kind yeah. of the extent of how much you are interacting with the game. Uh, but the thing with Dungeons and Degenerate Gamblers that is throwing me off is... There are a lot of different sub mechanics going on all because and then at the same time, this is a blackjack game where you don't necessarily know what next card is coming up. So you're kind of at the mercy of the draw. You're at the mercy of RNG, where Mm -hmm. even though there are mechanics that let you hold cards that give you a hand that let you play from the hand. You know, you have to build into those. You have to get those cards during your runs. And there's the fact that there are just 300 different cards, all with their own mechanics, all with their own flavor text. You kind of have to know, like, I'm constantly hovering over um, the cards just to see what they're doing. And maybe this is because I'm in that honeymoon period where something like Bellatra, I can just turn on when I'm eating lunch or I have a few minutes of downtime and just play through a game. I feel like I have to be, I have to pull, pay my full attention to Dungeons and Degenerate Gamblers just because, again, there's stuff like, oh, an advantage system where uh, you get one advantage depending on certain criteria of either the cards you get, winning rounds, and then those are how you activate certain cards' active abilities. Where, okay, if I draw into this card, it might have its own value for my towards my score of 21, or I can spend an advantage to activate it. And there's just a lot going on, a lot to consider. And I don't know, Matt, again, it it took me a while to really get into the groove just because I felt like a lot of the cards wanted you to be more active, but when you're at the mercy of a 
you know, a card draw that mm-hmm. automatically plays them right away. It's really hard to initially wrap your head around deck building about strategy and the like. But yeah. uh, Matt, did you are you did you get your hands on Dungeons and Degenerate Gamblers as well or look into it? Um, yeah, I did play this at one point. I can't remember if it was through a Steam Next Fest or an HIO, but I did play mm-hmm. through like a demo of this game. Yeah. And I honestly, for a lot of the time, barely had a grasp on what I was doing with my deck building as well. Right. Especially when um, there were, I remember there being some cards in like the opponent decks, like some special cards that would like switch your cards around with theirs. Yes. And I had no real idea on how I should be like playing around those, Mm -hmm. which is like really weird for me. And I think another thing that really, not necessarily adds to my frustration, but it was just another Mm -hmm. layer I had to consider was, so I said that in the beginning, you have a choice of four decks and say the heart um, Mm -hmm. deck is essentially... The healing for one, you, I think it was? Yeah, that's the healing yeah. deck. And for you to actually heal... So essentially, each suit has their own property. I, you know, healing mm-hmm. is... Our hearts are healing. One does more damage. One gives you armor. But the only way you activate those is if you score a blackjack, where mm. when you build up your... So each suit, again, has its own property. And then when you play towards 21, it kind of check marks a box on your scar card. And... Say if I hit 21 or if someone played a card that makes my threshold 20 or 22, say if I mm. played all 22 hearts for to get to that score, I'll heal for 22. Or if I played, say, 10 hearts and then 11 worth of the armor, I'll, get, I'll heal 10 and then I'll get 11 armor. Where I found mm. whenever a opponent played something that modified my score threshold i found it a lot more difficult where and then say i'm trying to build towards okay i only want jack i only want cards worth 10 and i only want aces in Mm -hmm, my mm -hmm. deck you know build towards 20 or 21 and then you'll get that one card that says okay Every time you play a heart card, it heals you, but it will take one um, value from that card every time it's played. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. there's just so much you have to get keep track of where, again, this is, as unfair as it is, this isn't me playing Bellagio. This is more so me playing Neoverse. This is me playing slightly as the Spire where I need to be locked in, focused, and everything going around where at the beginning I wasn't necessarily feeling it, Matt. And I think a few hours in now, I'm I don't want to say I have a better grasp, but I'm respecting the game a lot more. But mm-hmm. again, it I believe it is twenty dollars. Unfortunately when it did go live I believe the demo was taken off of Steam. So, or maybe that's just because I bought it and I can't play the demo anymore. Mm-hmm. But if there, maybe it's available on the uh, IO, I'm not sure. But I do recommend at least checking it out if this is within your vibe. And let's be honest, Matt, we're building the casino, uh, the roguelike casino. Mm-hmm. We have mm-hmm. uh, Bellatro, we have Dungeons and Degenerate Gamblers, we have, uh, what was it, Bingle Bingle. Uh, Matt, is Bingle Bingle the slots one or uh, the roulette one? The roulette. Oh, one. okay, okay. What other gambling game do you think can be adapted into the roguelike format? I mean, obviously slots. Yes, uh, is is probably a good one. What would be like a weird one? I, I'm trying to like think of like casino games, but I can't really think of any other than like the big four that we've already mentioned. Other than slots, poker, Maybe, like, darts. Uh, that's not really like a casino game, but I feel like you could darts up, you could balatro up a darts game. I think that would be pretty fun, Matt. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just know that there was that tiny team sale recently, and I just uh, added a bunch of roguelites yeah, <laughs> to my wish list. So, but yeah, I digress, Matt. Dungeons and Degenerate Gamblers, Matt. I think it does have a charm as someone with experience uh, uh, with different trading card games growing up. I really did. I uh, find myself, you know, enjoying a lot of the references that I saw. 
Uh, but at the same time, I feel like this needs some concentration. And if mm-hmm. it's up in your, if that's up your alley, uh, I do recommend it. Uh, I believe it is under 20 Canadian right now. Uh, but I think for me personally, maybe waiting for a bigger sale might be, uh, I would have felt a bit more comfortable, but uh, even at launch, I, I was really enjoying what I was playing, Matt. Mm-hmm. Right? But is this something you might uh, check out in the future? Or uh, Honestly, I don't think I'm going to like check it out in the future. Fair. You okay. know what, Jared, going back, one question. I, Ma- Mahjong might be a good Bellatro. <laughs> Isn't there a Mahjong is, Bellatro? Oh, I'm there pretty one? sure there is. I, I've heard some rumblings about it where it's essentially... If you were to look at it and told me that Bellatro received a Mahjong <laughs> expansion, I would have believed you. Oh, man. Uh, but... I was also thinking Yahtzee, but I think that's basically what Dicey Dungeons is. Man, speaking about um, Bellatro, there was also a update uh, from the dev team posted last week as well. Uh, Matt, mm-hmm. the team announced that... Uh, Essentially, there will be a major gameplay update coming to Bellatro in 2025. This update will bring new ideas and strategies to the game and will be released across all platforms. And as a token of a huge appreciation to the game's brilliant, passionate community, the update will be completely free. So Matt, Mm -hmm. uh, gameplay update coming in 2025. Really excited because Matt Bellatro is still one of those games I do go back to uh, just when I have a bit of downtime. And I believe, you know, passionate community, as the dev says, uh, they released a mod, uh, a community mod, um, that really makes it a lot more accessible to those visually impaired. So also cool stuff coming from the dev team and, of course, the um, community as well, where mm-hmm. I'm, I'm really curious to see uh, when or what the gameplay update is. And that, let's be honest, Mm -hmm. uh, my eyes will probably lose to Father Time. So (laughs) when that eventually happens, at least I'll know the community has my back to continue to play Bellatro. Oh, Jaren, I'm so, I'm so, I'm going to be really sad when my my vision really, really goes. Uh, Hate to see it, Matt. You hate Mm -hmm. to see it. Mm -hmm. But Matt, Mm -hmm. you know what I loved to see last week? What is it, Jaren? So, Matt, the Olympics uh, have concluded. Yes. And, Matt, this, I think, pound for pound, maybe it's just because I've been following it a lot closely. (laughs) This has been a really, Matt, is unique the right word to describe the 2024 Paris Olympics? Uh, Just from all, Matt, there's been some drama, of course. And Mm -hmm. let's push that aside for now. Mm-hmm. Just the amount of memes to come out of uh, oh yeah yeah the Olympics this time need to mm-hmm. shout out. I know people are gonna roll their eyes, but Matt, mm-hmm. we got to shout out to the free to play uncle, don't we? Yep, got to shout out free to play uncle. <laughs> but we discussed it last week, Matt. Breaking has made its debut at the Summer Olympics, and mm-hmm. Matt. Mm-hmm. Should I say it's also farewell at the Summer Olympics? Yeah, because probably. I mean, l- l- let's just get this out of the way, Matt. Um, mm-hmm. Confirm not returning to LA uh, summer 2028. And mm-hmm. while it has a chance to come back in the 2032, I believe Sack Slussler. Uh, Vice President of Breaking for Gold USA and USA Dance, uh, told reporters that he thinks it's unlikely to make an appearance, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, eight years down the road. So, Mm -hmm. Matt, let's Mm -hmm. put that behind us for now and let's celebrate Breaking uh, coming, making its debut and hopefully having a showing in the Paris 2024 Olympics. And Matt... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, I think we both have affinity of, you know, breaking and street dance culture um, in general. Matt, I know you have done your own routine, uh, have participated in routines back in the day. I personally have a dance related injury playing Dance <laughs> Central. So I believe <laughs> as outsiders looking in, we're qualified mm-hmm. to talk about breaking uh-huh. at the Olympics. Uh-huh. And 
Matt got to start yes. off. Um, should we just go through our general thoughts? Uh, starting off with the women's uh, B-Girl event that happened first. I believe that happened on the Friday. Um, Matt, overall, mm-hmm. how did you feel? Actually, before we get into the events themselves, yes, I know this is something that we discussed initially. And I have to ask, mm-hmm. how do you feel about the overall format of the breaking events? I like the format for the breaking events. I think it is like very, um, what do you call it? I guess like representative of what I would want of them just being a bunch of uh, basically one-on-one battles in a round robin mm-hmm. format. Then, which then leads to, you know, it's uh, what do you call it? Like quarterfinal semis and like gold, bronze matches. I think yeah. That's like a good system. I think Jaron, the thing that really I wish had more real clarification on it is the kind of like scoring rubric that right. they use for the thing because like they do kind of say oh yeah it's going to be like uh the breaking performances are going to be gauged on uh five categories yep so essentially um, the way the events were judged was a panel mm-hmm. of nine judges score each battle and every round is based on as you said that five criteria technique mm-hmm vocabulary execution musicality and originality mm-hmm. each category accounts for 20 percent of the final score mm-hmm. and matt mm-hmm. i don't know how you feel but even though they stress that each category is worth you know equally worth 20 percent, yeah i feel like especially variety which i guess would be vocabulary mm-hmm seem to be have more heavily favored than say something like technique or execution yeah um, because there were a lot of i know we'll get into it um when we talk about the events themselves but from again my outsider perspective there were a lot of times where from you know the casual viewer at home watching through a screen that there were a lot of you know for lack of a better team uh, term routines that I believe had you know really good execution technique at hand but they would end up losing just because mm-hmm. the variety wasn't necessarily there or the amount of repeats from round to round uh, kind of was present where um, how did you yeah. feel like the criteria was even though it said Matt all everything was equal. Did you feel like the judges seemed to favor one a few categories over the other? Yeah, I feel like they did definitely kind of like favor more things uh, over other things. I think also I don't like their kind of the way they showed off their points format where it was like, oh, each judge really just gives like a one or a vote for one person or the other for like yep. that particular round. I think I would have far more preferred something like, like nine judges, I think was a lot for uh, how this worked, but I think it is because they did that, like either this person gets my vote or this person gets my vote for the round. So I understand why they went with nine there, but Mm -hmm. I think it would have been better if it was like, you know, three or five people. And instead of seeing those kind of um, binary votes, you get to see the totals of their grade for each of the five categories. Right which I think would make it like feel a bit better in terms of, I guess, the viewer understanding why this person won or this person lost. Yes, because I'll be... I watched the stream from the Canadian... with the Canadian broadcast. I was talking to a friend mm-hmm. who watched, you know, the UK broadcast, the American broadcast as well. And I think one thing we all had in common was from that from a production standpoint from i guess the announcers or the commentators it was really difficult to kind of know like the scoring itself didn't seem to be explained to the mm-hmm, mm-hmm. casual viewer as well where there were some instances of oh you know the history especially if the announcer or the commentator had history with a competitor mm-hmm. um that stuff was cool but again from just a purely since breaking for better or for worse had such not the discourse going into it was all over the place <laughs> even coming out of it all over the place but mm-hmm. it was definitely an event that had a lot of eyes 
looking, peering into it. Mm-hmm. And as much as I respected the energy of the commentators, I think from a more technical, um, pres- like, I guess, source, it wasn't the greatest, I also felt, where I appreciate the energy, but again, it didn't contribute to alleviating my confusion of how this is all being scored. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. how did you feel about the music, how the music was utilized? Just because throughout the event as well, the commentators especially stressed that, hey, going into this, this isn't like gymnastics. This isn't like synchronized swimming. You don't come in with your song of choice. You mm-hmm. are at the mercy of what the DJ is essentially playing. And yeah, before I kind of go in, initially, what did you think of how they were handling the music? I mean, I think they handled the music fine. I thought that like the music choices were honestly like perfectly fine for what this uh, was. Mm-hmm. I guess like it would maybe would have been a bit more interesting. If it was a lot more of the stuff you kind of hear in kind of like, you know, like Red Bulls, like competitions and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. But like, strictly speaking for me, for the music, I thought it was like perfectly fine. It didn't affect me one way or another. I think the, the choices that they made were all like pretty pretty decent yeah i think from a music selection that i popped off a a few times when Mm -hmm. you know specific tracks were played but i guess it does add to the level of competition just because there were a few times where some of the song selections were a bit odd where even i think it was one of the matches where ami from the women's side was dancing and her body language wasn't necessarily feeling that one track that they were playing. Mm -hmm. And again, you are kind of at the mercy of what the DJ is picking. And as a competitor, you have to adapt. But I think what threw me off, Matt, and I'm not sure if I, how I feel about it overall is going into the event, I thought from a format perspective, you would, you know, you start your, top rock and you start your footwork and the moment you start your floor work or your floor section Mm -hmm. i thought that you would have a kind of a duration like oh you you're on the floor you only have like 30 to 45 seconds before you have to pass it on and i know that's not how it usually works in you know the competition the other competitions um you know that I mean, are, had a soft time limit. There was a sense. soft time limit, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I think for the most part, I did appreciate how it was executed just because Matt, mm-hmm. again, overall this, I was really impressed by the event just because this brought a level of energy that I personally didn't don't necessarily feel from the Olympics until skateboarding <laughs> was introduced <laughs> uh-huh. in Tokyo, where that, mm-hmm. again, n- on paper, breaking should not <laughs> have any business at the Olympics. And Matt, yeah, according uh-huh. to all the online discourse, people firmly believe that. But as mm-hmm. someone who appreciates the culture, who can, who will yell at the top of their lungs, watch this watch the athleticism on display watch the body control what where that of course Mm -hmm. like it's when i first initially heard it i raised an eyebrow but at the same time i was excited because this is how you make me watch the olympics but (laughs) Uh um at the same time matt what i mean by the energy was so different was at i don't know about you matt but it felt a lot break there were instances during the breaking event that felt more grimy than should be allowed in the olympics if that makes sense where two um two examples come to my mind instantly okay one from the men's and one from the women's Mm -hmm. um matt remember Mm -hmm. from the men's or from the men's event matt it was when phil had that read on shiggy kicks where Mm -hmm. when Shiggy did the pose and then Phil did the pose as well. I immediately <laughs> got up. I popped. And then oh, man. Mm-hmm. Matt, remember in the women, I believe it was also the women's uh, semifinals 
when it was six seven one versus uh, Nika. And yeah. when it looked like Nico was about to start, <laughs> six seven <laughs> one just jumped in. Matt, oh man, dude, I that's went so good. <laughs> crazy in my living room where oh, man. I did. Matt, uh huh, that shouldn't be allowed in the Olympics, <laughs> and yet that was the most energetic oh, I've man. ever been watching the Olympics. Jared, that was such a good like, Jared. I think I almost. I agree that like it's sh- you shouldn't have something that grimy in the Olympics. But if I'm gonna watch break dancing, I want to watch that grime. Yes, like I want the audience pushed up against the stage so that you can see them just freaking out <laughs> when when stuff like that happens, or like you know having the other competitors on stage so that you can like pull <laughs> like pull their reactions as well. Where I again. I what I appreciated most again and as an outsider looking in mm-hmm. was just the authenticity it felt where when I'm not sure if you remember the discourse when skating was first brought to like Tokyo and it was oh they're going to essentially uh sanitize what skateboarding culture is for the Olympics and then mm-hmm. likewise when breaking was announced it was that oh they're going to again sanitize this culture and i was heavenly impressed matt because matt Mm -hmm. come on Mm -hmm. what other event did you see them straight up saying hey this is phil wizard hey (laughs) this is logistics for better for worse hey this is ray gun Uh where again matt i appreciated how you know, everyone was just coming up in their battle gear, and that mm-hmm. made me so so happy. But Matt, mm-hmm. I guess let's just go through it. Um, did you? Was there anything notable? Any favorite moments? Uh, and just, I guess, overall thoughts. We'll start off with the women, the B girl competition. Overall, how did you fe- uh, feel about uh, okay. the showcase on Friday, Jaron? I cannot believe that. India from the ne- was it Netherlands, yeah, had to pre qualify to get into the that was literally insane. Like, she should have been at least like s- seed six or higher, mm-hmm. I think, based on like how she performed. Matt, now that you opened the floodgates, mm-hmm. <sighs> Matt, uh huh, no disrespect to Ami, congratulations for the W, yeah. I I, I kind of feel like <laughs> India should have taken that one. Oh man, yeah, yeah, Jaren. I in my notes right now under women's semifinal with the um, Ami versus India match, Jaren. How I don't understand how Ami blew out India eight one. Yes, that is insane to me. That should have been a five four decision. I think in in like either direction. Matt. Hmm. There were a lot of that throughout the weekend, both men and women's, where there were a lot more blowouts than, again, as a casual viewer, I was kind of uncomfortable with, where, I don't know, (laughs) you also have a lot, okay, I I don't want to go into the veteran conspiracy theory, but Uh you you know how, what they say, Matt, uh, oh, this is all for Olympic events with you know, subjective judging for the most part. You're not yeah. based on skill. You're based on <laughs> bribes and whatnot, where mm-hmm. kind of at the back of my head, it was, there were some times where they would essentially give the veteran the blowout, where I, I yeah. feel like uh, this wasn't the best look. And the Ami versus India especially had me, as a fan of Ami, mm-hmm. scratching my head a lot. Likewise, yeah. Matt, Mm -hmm. Ami versus Nika also had me kind of scratching my head a lot as well. Yeah. Jaren, that should have been, like, honestly, either, like, Nika versus India, or somehow if they could have, like, redone the bracket, Nika versus 6-7, or what is it, 6-7-1? Yeah. As, as, like, the final. Or India versus 6-7-1. Like, those would all have been very good finals. Where... Shout out to six seven one. Mm-hmm. Her body language during the bronze medal, like my partner and I were talking, like six seven one did not look happy at all. Yeah, and again, it's 
I guess this is what happens when you have seeds like this, when you have brackets like this. Depending on what bracket you end up in, these mm-hmm. matchups would be mm-hmm. a lot more different. But yeah. again, overall, I liked... For better or for worse, I do like how the women did start it off, especially just because, Matt, mm-hmm. the age ranges uh, oh, yeah, on wild. display <laughs> where mm-hmm. I think every the exclamation point was India, you know, I believe 18 years old versus Ayumi, uh, 41 years old, where, again, just, Matt, let's be mm-hmm. honest, seeing mm-hmm. the... Mid thirty pluses represent uh, us was validating uh-huh. in a way mm-hmm. where th- again that's what I appreciated so much on this event where you have such a stark age range and yet the younger person didn't like their W wasn't necessarily locked in and that's what I kind of appreciated mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. from the showcases overall and yeah when the I really did enjoy the quarter the semifinals specifically as well um and again i feel like with ami's run that's where we saw the judges really to me at least Mm -hmm. seem to favor the variety uh technique and execution where I don't know. I, I I'm conflicted just because again, Matt, I, I big fan of Ami, but at the same yeah. time, I think India danced so well. Her yeah. story of, as you said, Matt, having to qualify was nuts, and I was just hoping that her going all the way or even nabbing the bronze um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. would have been such a great story to tell. But mm-hmm. between Ami six seven one India and Nika. All four very strong competitors, all four deserving their, you know, chance to showcase their talents and to mm-hmm. compete for those medals where not, I'm not mad at the final standings, but again, I'm, I'm still kind of scratching mm-hmm. my head of what I, I really do wish we saw the breakdowns of what the judges were thinking. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. uh, Matt? Mm-hmm. Production wise, what did you think of the 360 camera and from the replays? <laughs> Jaron, I I both liked it and thought it was a little bit like cringy to use for some reason. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. I I kind of because I saw them using that throughout like a lot of um other Olympic events. Yeah, and I really hope that at some point that leads to some kind of streaming service or you know maybe maybe it might be like too extreme. To like have it streaming, but like some kind of, I don't know. Do they do they do like Blu-ray editions of uh, the Olympics? I'm not where, sure, man. Yeah, like where you, or like some you know some kind of download edition or like software or something where you can actually like stitch together all those videos and you can watch the match from whatever angle you want. Mm-hmm. That would be really cool, Tech. That'd be really cool. Yeah, just because, Matt, not going to lie, there were some instances, both men and women's, where just the way the camera was positioned, the other competitor would be blocking uh, the moves from the person dancing. That that really Mm -hmm. got on my nerves, where I I do wish there was other um, just angles that you can view it from. But again, Mm -hmm. overall, Matt, I I love the women's event. Uh, not just a mm. lot of break dancing this weekend between the round robins and just the yes, actual the yes, finals, yes. which was fun. But mm-hmm. um, going to the men's event on the Saturday, mm-hmm. and Matt, I feel like mm. the men's event specifically highlighted something I wasn't necessarily thinking about during the women's event. But going back to the music, I do like the kind of strategic element of again trying to ride out the song to essentially deny your opponent either a chorus or, you know, a good, you know, Mm -hmm. let's say breakbeat section. Yeah. Where, again, musicality is one of the factors. And especially there, I think it was Shiggy Kicks who would 
kind of prolong his set just to be able to hit certain points of the song so his opponent wouldn't be able to hit that point mm-hmm, of the song, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which, again, made me pop off a lot as well. But mm-hmm. on the flip side, I think... I forget who it was, but they got that, you know, the Apache... It was either the Apache song or the sample from... Yes. Everyone knows it from, you know, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And that one person who got the chorus of the song was, I thought, pretty rough that. Mm-hmm. Where I'm not sure if you remember that section or in terms of either denying someone a part of the song or a competitor getting not the greatest part of the songs. Any do any of those stick out to you from what you watched? For me, Jaron, it's not really because I think I just didn't know a lot of these songs, so I wasn't Fair. really aware of them. Kind of like cutting them off for any particular mm-hmm. parts. That's fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Matt. Mm-hmm. Before we start off with the um, the men like the men's battles specifically, mm-hmm. from a production standpoint, this was really rough. Where did you watch the introductions to the competitors in the round robin? Oh no, I did not. Did did that like <laughs> did that just Matt, like fall apart? Four times, four separate times, the announcers. So essentially, the order the announcers had was different than the order they were sending out people. Oh, where you had people being labeled the or being called the wrong name. You had some competitors run out, realize they weren't being called, and then run back. Matt, it was a mess. <laughs> oh, no. It oh. was. I wasn't a fan of it. I thought after how well the women's. Um, event went the day prior. I don't know. I think that specifically the introductions I thought was really unfortunate and re- kind of disrespectful to the competitors as well. It's but, kind of weird. Like, yeah, I, I don't understand how you can like you know mess it up on a on the Olympics just because that's a thing times you do that. in every single yeah like event. <laughs> it's not like a breaking only thing. It it was rough, Matt, but. Matt, mm-hmm. had mm-hmm. to ask you, the men's, uh, w- overall, what did you think of the event? And were, were there any matchups that come to your mind? Even just like the opening of the uh, first like men's like round robin was mm-hmm. wild from the jump, I think. Yeah. Like just the opening round having what's uh, Shigex's like kind of like spin where like his basically whole sweater comes off. Yep. Like, I thought that was like a wild kind of just like opening round for the uh, men's breaking. Mm-hmm. Jaren, I I felt so bad for J Attack. Yeah. Uh, just like how rough like all of his uh, matchups were. I'm glad he got one point in the end. Um, Again, Matt, ma- mm-hmm. mm-hmm. a lot of sweeps or yeah. just like really a harsh scoring uh, mm. throughout the entire run. Where, again, I was really surprised at, as as a casual viewer, a lot of the matchups seemed a lot closer than mm-hmm. they were actually scored. Which also kind of, for me personally, kind of put a damper on things. Just because, again, it emphasized how much I didn't understand how this was uh, being scored. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, Matt, uh, anything in particular, at least from the round robins before we get into, I guess, the finals? I think, Jaren, I, I actually really, throughout the uh, round robins, really grew to like Lee uh, mm-hmm. and like all of his performances. I thought they were all like really, really good. I actually noticed one or one thing that I noticed a lot more often with uh, the men's versus the women's is how much more they actually were using the music itself yes. into their, into like I guess their like choreography. Like there were so many more like. I guess like well timed slides or freezes or you know just general hits on a beat. Yep, that looked a lot better on on the men's side. And that you know mm-hmm. I'm I'm a sucker for that when mm-hmm. whether it be a dance move, ISOs, or just like being able to hit uh, something that an instrument that isn't the drums or better yet a lyric that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I pop so hard. And as you said, a lot of that was definitely on display, you know, both the uh, round robins Mm -hmm. and I guess all the different finals. But Mm -hmm. going into the finals themselves, Matt, again, I think 
some really rough matchups, but the talent on display, I feel like any one of the eight competitors could have taken home a medal, but Mm -hmm. have to highlight Matt. Mm -hmm. Don't want to be that guy, you know, shout out to (laughs) B-Boy Victor. Uh Uh, Hell of a performance. Congratulations on the bronze. Not not Mm -hmm. necessarily sure how Victor, uh, went away with the bronze. I know a lot of people were trying to explain that. Again, this was uh, from a variety standpoint yes. that that might have been what pushed him over the edge. But what what was your take on the bronze medal matchup, Matt? Sharon, okay, so this isn't really about the bronze okay. one itself. But I was, you know, while we're on the topic of Victor, I'm very surprised <laughs> That the audience actually like booed when, like, on the completion of his uh set with uh hero, hero ten. Yeah, like I thought that, 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 was, that was that was rough. wild. Yeah. Um, but like, I don't know. I think like Victor's win was like I thought it was it was like fair. I the blowout at the first part was like maybe a little weird for me just to see like a blowout in the. Um, like that level of the competition, even though I guess yeah. like men's gold had <laughs> double blowouts for uh, yeah. for uh, Phil Wizard, but you know, I I I thought like they both could have like gone well with like the bronze mm-hmm. medal. Fair, Matt. Fair, mm-hmm. and yeah, going into the finals with Danny and Phil, Matt, mm-hmm. Danny's slip up on the third round that that legit <laughs> broke my heart. Uh. Where, I. Uh, Immediately, Phil goes into essentially his victory lap. And overall, I think it was a really, it was a good final battle. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And of course, Matt, obligatory, we're Canadian, so we have to shout yep. out Phil Wizard. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, mm-hmm. Matt, uh-huh. as Canadians, what did you think of Phil's run? Uh, just his Olympic run overall as well. I mean, I liked I liked all of his stuff. Um, I, I liked basically all of his, his sets. Um Jared, I I'm so sad he had to go and beat down Lee like basically back to back. Yeah, that was oh man, that was so. Not, Lee put so his heart out. To see. Lee put his heart out. Respect to uh-huh. Lee. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I hope I hope uh, if the Olympics comes back, I hope uh, Lee comes back. Thirty thirty two per air circle, Matt. Oh man. Uh, but overall, but yeah, not I guess mm-hmm. with breaking twenty twenty four to twenty twenty four. Uh, just in general, Matt, what are your kind of closing thoughts on how it was executed overall? I think it was like executed as maybe not as like 70% of the way that I would have expected Mm -hmm. it to be executed compared to like, I guess like what would have been perfectly executed as far as like, you know, their first time doing the event goes. Uh, I think like the biggest issue for me was kind of the obscurity of the scoring. Yep. Jordan, I know a lot of the people kind of like I was seeing like a lot of like basically like fifty fifty percent of like people bashing the CBC uh commentators. But I, I like them, Jared. I like them. They were they really realize how many how many breakdancing moves I don't actually know the names of. Mm-hmm. Where I, I appreciate their enthusiasm and mm-hmm. of course they're Canadian. They have to shout out. Uh yes, the Phil Bias might have been a bit too much yeah. for me, but it, I understood it. I understood it. But yeah, I don't know. yeah, Jaren, the the drop of Konichi Wagwan was I, the perfect, perfect Canadian. I broke. I I clapped, Matt. Oh, that was man. so good. But no, I I totally agree because mm-hmm. again, Matt, mm-hmm. I love the energy that breaking brought to the Olympics, and yes, it pains me that we don't get to see it in LA in 2028, just because I do feel like this was a good showing. And Mm -hmm. despite some of the online discourse and all the memes, I feel like it was able to win a lot of people over. But at the same time, this was its first outing. I feel like you can still continue to refine it, similar to how Mm -hmm. skateboarding has been kind of refined from, you know, 2021, I guess, to 2024. Um, I feel like you can definitely continue to do it. It is an... a way for you to bring in just a new audience to the Olympics overall to get them just excited about that zeitgeist. And Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I, I just, I hope, you know, that prayer circle that it does come back in 30. Oh God, that's so disgusting to say, Matt, in eight years, <laughs> yes. because I feel like it's there. I feel like you can clean it up a bit. I feel like you can make judging a lot more transparent for the casuals to really understand what's happening. And I don't know, Matt, I enjoyed it. But again, it also breaks my heart that it won't be there next time around. But I'm hoping in the future it does because the potential is there. I mean, Jaren, you know, if it comes back in eight years, we can still get, who can we still get? We can still get Lee, if J Attack can, yep. can make it back. India, Basically, India. the top three, uh, the top four minus like Ami can, Ami actually maybe might come back for the women's side. Ami, Ami right. could do it. Eight, she's 25, I believe, right? She, she can do it. Mm-hmm. Not... Yeah, yeah, she can come back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I hope a Yumi somehow makes it. <laughs> She's gonna be what? Uh, what does she want? I think it'll be like forty nine, dude. Forty nine, fifth, Matt. Oh man! Mm-hmm. As, as people in eight years who w- oh. would be cheering for her, I, I, I hope she has it in her. Um, oh man, Matt. Mm-hmm. I forgot to ask you. Okay, hmm. so it's up to the competitors on the fly to figure out who goes first. Yes. So, Matt, if you were if you stepped into the circle arena. Uh, what would your preference be? Jaren, I think I would want to go first. Mm-hmm. I don't think I would want to have to worry about like having to like rebuttal moves. Yeah. And I think once you have more of a groove on the music, you can do more of the I guess what's the like actual like term for this? Where like it's not actually a rebuttal, but you know, you predict their move and you yeah. also do it while they're doing their move. So good, Matt. Where... Oh man, the 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 quarterfinal when Danny does the kind of like the the drink tilt back at the same time. Yep, yep. yep. As uh, uh, who was he facing in that? Was oh, was that uh, Jeffro? Jeffro, yes, it was yeah, Jeffro yeah. on, on on that like round. Oh, that was so good. That was so good, Matt. Just the mm-hmm. the sportsmanship between Danny and Jeffro. That was a good showcase. I mm-hmm. really enjoyed that mm-hmm. matchup. Where. Mm-hmm. Again, I thought Jeffro had more, would have gotten more points than he did. I, yeah. I believe it was kind of close, but not. There were some rounds that Danny had a good point majority, but I thought it would, should mm-hmm. have been closer in my opinion. But again, Matt, outsider mm-hmm. looking in, all I did yeah. was hurt my knee playing Dan Central. So what do I know? <laughs> uh, but no, I agree. I, I think I would prefer to go first, Matt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, just being able to answer uh gives me anxiety where I, I i want to be able to set the the tone and uh, matt that six seven one jump in still kills me that that was so good jared that, that was disgusting and that i i couldn't believe what was happening but overall matt Mm-hmm. good showing it made me want to go to my parents find my ps2 and break out <laughs> b-boy um which was better than it had any right to be. Uh, Matt, I mm-hmm. found myself going to a lot of toy and card collector uh, expos recently, and so many times did I see Need for Speed Most Wanted uh, <laughs> and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 uh, on sale for reasonably priced, and I wish I had a CRT to properly play those. Oh, man. Uh, but Matt, mm-hmm. breaking 2024... I guess we have to pour one out. Um, I know everyone probably expects us to talk about Raygun. I don't want to talk about Raygun. <laughs> yeah, the, the whole thing about Raygun is, is kind of wild. I, it, I kind of feel like bad about both of Australia's competitors. It it pains me that the Raygun discourse is overshadowing what was honestly such a sick B-girl showcase. But what can yeah, you do? Matt, I will memes admit, will though, meme. Pulling Ray Gun from her name is so actually such a good name. <laughs> it is a good name. Oh, Again, that. Quake. What other events uh, do we see? Phil Wizard, Logistics, Ray Gun, Quake, mm. je- like on display there. So good, Matt. So good. So, so good. good. But, Matt, mm-hmm. beefy boy episode so far. But, mm-hmm. you know, we have to hit them with another Don't Match Me challenge this oh, week. Uh, Matt. I guess this week I'm stepping into the circle arena first because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Matt, I put together the don't match me challenge this week and uh-huh. surprise 
breaking 2024 at the Olympics uh, oh, inspired. Uh, so, Matt. Jared, how so, crazy would it be if I just 6 7 one you right now and do my own Don't Match Me? Do you have your own Don't Match Me, Matt? No, I don't. But that would be really good. <laughs> that would have been a, an amazing goof. That would have oh, been man. an amazing goof. But, Matt, mm-hmm. Don't Match Me Challenge, I'm going to go five categories. Um, you know, each getting a bit more specific, and I'll ask a question. You and our friends listening just have to pick an answer that doesn't match mine. And Matt, Mm -hmm. again, this is inspired by breakdancing's, you know, debut and maybe last hurrah at the Olympics. So (laughs) starting off, Matt, first question, Mm -hmm. name any dance move, just name any dance move in five, four, three, two, one, Matt. Mm hmm. I mentioned Dance Central, you know, uh-huh. earlier, you know, Hurt My Knee. Uh-huh. And to quote the song that made me hurt my knee, Matt, <laughs> you know how I go with that UFO. I picked, if you picked a UFO, sorry, you're out. Oh, man. Jaren, I picked that Air Flares. Matt? Mm-hmm. A lot of beautiful Air Flares during mm-hmm. the Olympic mm-hmm. showcases. Mm-hmm. But Matt? Mm-hmm. Since uh, the Mistake Zone is game adjacent, we talked about some games earlier. Yes. Name any game franchise where you can use a dance-based attack. Dance-based attack. To be more specific, name any game or franchise that lets you do a dance move as an attack or as a buff. Just something that lets you do dance in the form of combat or support. Mm-hmm. So in five, four, three, two, one, Matt. Uh huh. If you or our friends said Def Jam, fight for New York. Ooh. I'm sorry, you're out. Shout out to Crazy Legs. <laughs> oh man, Jaren, I was really scared you were gonna call me out on picking uh Eddie from uh, Tekken, just fighting with Capi Capoeira Capoeira. Yep. I've never known how to say this word properly. Me neither, Matt. And mm-hmm. you've known me a little while because I am bad at saying things. <laughs> but uh, moving on, mm-hmm. name any country represented in either men's or women's breaking this year at the 2024 Paris Olympics. Mm-hmm. Name any country represented in either um, men's or women's. So in five, four, three, two one matt Mm -hmm. if you or your friends said the netherlands you are out oh man jaren you got me you got oh no i'm sorry matt oh man jaren you know you know what no i had to i had to represent for lee and india yeah matt Uh uh-huh they won our hearts they definitely won our hearts and i too had to shout them out Uh uh-huh where matt Mm mm-hmm I, I might be cheating with, with what I'm about to do, but <laughs> okay. I, I feel like it's in the spirit of the Olympics at the very least. So for the second last round, Matt, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. name any category that the judges uh, judged the breaking competition. Oh. So name any, so just a kind of, not necessarily say them out loud, but there were five categories that the judges considered during the breakdancing uh, competition at the Olympics this year. So just name any one of those five categories in five, four, three, two, one. Matt and friends, mm. if you said originality, you're out. Ooh, Jared, I went with musicality. Musicality, Matt. I was gonna mm. do variety, but that wasn't a real one. So, <laughs> Matt, I, we said mm. variety a lot during this episode. Mm-hmm. It, that would be a vocabulary, right? In, yeah, in the context of the five categories. Like okay. Considered, uh, so, variety, right? So, Matt, final mm. round, and this is where I was cheating because Matt, okay, <laughs> okay. there are only five uh, selections for round two, but. In the spirit of the Olympics and, of course, in the spirit of, you know, just celebrating all, not only all of the competitors, but also the winners. Final round of Don't Match Me this week. Just name any medalist 
from either men's or the women's uh, breaking competition this year at the Olympics. Just name Ooh. any medalist. Okay. In five, okay. four, three, two, one. Matt? Mm-hmm. Had to give it to the women's bronze medalist who won most grimy in my heart. Half oh, to, I picked six, seven, one. Oh, man. Jared, I got got again. <laughs> oh, no. That, oh, that jump in, mm. that jump in, I will be thinking about that. Yeah. <laughs> Jared, that, for me, it was like 671 or Nika for, for yeah. this pick. I know I, I should have went Phil Wizard, big ups Canada, <laughs> but at the same time, Matt, mm-hmm. even though Phil's read, disgusting, mm, 671, mm-hmm. shook, still shook. Still, oh, that read will live in my mind, but <laughs> I wasn't, oh. that, that, that jumping will haunt me <laughs> for the rest of my life. Man. <laughs> oh, that was so good. So Jared, good, that man. was some real you got served bullshit. <laughs> That's an energy I never expected at the uh, Olympics, Matt, but we saw it. Oh, man. And you know what, Matt? Big ups to Nika for not letting that phase her. Oh, because man. yeah. <laughs> if that was me, <laughs> Matt, you know me. You've known me. <laughs> For decades now, oh, I'd man. be on the floor crying <laughs> if that happened to me. Oh man, Jaron, I like honestly when I saw that, I could not stop thinking of that. You got served scene when Omarion just like backflips on that dude. Yep. Oh man. Oh. The mental fortitude of <laughs> Nika. Big ups to her. Congratulations on your oh. silver. Um. Congratulations again to 671 with their bronze. Congratulations to Ami for the gold. And then on the men's side, big ups to Phil with the gold. Big ups to Danny for the bro- uh, the silver. And big ups to Victor for the bronze. And Matt, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. big ups to you, as always, for joining me this week and editing this podcast. And Matt, mm-hmm. big ups to you for, you know, trucking along with your chips. <laughs> uh, and not feeling great afterwards. Oh man, Jaren, I'm so sweaty. But you know, Jaren, I of course want to say, you know, thanks to you for as always hosting this uh, show, uh, bringing the don't match me this week, and Jaren bringing up B Boy because I've been watching gameplay of this ever since you brought it up, and I did not know this game existed. This game looks wild because yeah. I was honestly thinking before, why isn't there like a break dancing equivalent of like a Tony Hawk game? b-boy plays notably better than it has any right to play oh, where i i need to find that my old ps2 because i need to play it and see if it actually does hold up mm-hmm. uh but i remember being pleasantly surprised when i picked it up from Walmart. matt mm-hmm. big ups to the ten dollar walmart bar- <laughs> uh, bargain bin that does no longer exist because i got b-boy from there Mm-hmm. I got Amplitude from there. I got Time Ooh. Slitters 2 from there. Oh, a lot of good pulls from that $10 bargain bin mm-hmm. uh, from Walmart. And I know Walmart still has their display cases with their cheap games, but not $10, man. Not $10. Mm-hmm. Hate to see it, Matt. Hate oh, to see man. it. But love mm-hmm. chopping it up every week with you, Matt. So please take it away. This has been the Mistake Zone, and we no longer have breakdancing in the Olympics. Oh, we're all out of breakdancing in the Olympics. Wow, I messed this up, Jaren. Damn. <laughs> Matt, that's what happens when 671 jumps in. <laughs> <laughs>